All right, so I'm going to get highly speculative here and just kind of come from my perspective and just what I see and what, I, what I've seen happen and what I see probably developing as this moves forward. So Samsung is just the first one to really hit the U.S. market heavy for these. And I'm not familiar with external markets outside of just domestic U.S., so forgive me for any ignorance there. But here in the U.S., I think we're going to see a similar wave that we saw with regular VRF. Uh, it took some time, and it didn't. It was not an overnight thing. It, it kind of feels like it maybe now to some people, but in reality, when you look back and you look at how far they had to go, it it was it was not overnight. Uh, VRF, while it gained a lot of momentum over the decades. Uh, or it was it was a decade plus uh, of of it trying to because uh, I remember the early systems um, they were a pain from a service perspective they were a pain but even then they offered I mean they heck we're still talking about in the days where we were dealing with the normal was an eight to ten seer system. And you come in there with a VRF, I mean, heck, it had a control package nobody could figure out. But if you could make the thing turn on and run, holy cow. I mean, it it was, it was, it changed a lot. And it really pushed the industry forward. It was, it was a interesting technology. So I see similar threads happening to the, to the children's side. So I kind of spoke on this before, but I see this really starting to press on, the especially the scroll air cooled market because end of the day if we just put everything fairly this is a this is a, a scroll air cooled chiller and it's got a unique control package and layout that makes it very compact in ways that a traditional air cooled chiller you know following traditional design methodology just doesn't quite uh, work out the same. I'm curious to see from a price point perspective, and my gut tells me that these will probably end up being priced pretty competitively to a lot of other scroll air-cooled chillers. And not to mention just why, I think this will also push on the regular VRF market, especially with the new refrigerants rolling out and everybody's, um, Everybody's up in arms about the high flammability issues that are, everybody's discussing, and I'm not going to get into that here. I, 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 to me, at the end of the day, refrigerant's refrigerant. We've gone through all kinds of changes in the past. Refrigerant itself is already flammable. Yeah, I know it doesn't stack and migrate, and you know you can get a. I've seen, I've seen videos where people didn't uh, properly recover. Or whatever else and they ended up you know causing a fire because you know some propane or something was able to collect uh, into a, a consolidated low spot and they didn't know it until they went to light a torch or something so I'm not disregarding those things but end of the day this is just another change in refrigerant and are so modifying a little bit further our practices to accommodate and this is just the way the industry has always been. This is not anything new. And it's not, it's, this is just another phase that we will go through more phases as, as technology and as time progresses. Anyway, that being said, this gives the customers the opportunity to benefit from a lot of the VRF efficiency and, uh, and modularity benefits without having to have refrigerant in their space and without having to uh, have to deal with all the, the consequences of bad piping. And the, the, I think I've actually said it two different ways. There's two Achilles heels to a traditional VRF. One, the piping. Uh, bad piping with poor slopes and not allowing proper oil return is absolutely one of them. Or doing proper joints and stuff, which ends up leading to uh, what well, a lot of it just it comes back to our ability to maintain oil return and keeping 
enough velocity in the system to maintain proper flow throughout. The other side of it is the control panel and the and the modules in there are very sensitive. They've gotten better, but they're still very sensitive and uh, they will on a system with a poor grid and, and little protection, which most of them are, you know, that's, that's, that's vast majority of my C going in. They have no kind of surge protection in them. They have no kind of incoming voltage protection other than what's built into the VRF already, which isn't enough. Um, and a lot of these major metros we've got right now, they, they've all got major power issues. And it's been that way for a long time. So the likelihood those things are going to get resolved anytime soon is next to none. Both of those things are uh, critical weaknesses. But we can eliminate the piping weakness altogether. Now granted, you can still pipe, chill water pipe wrong. But a chill water pipe install and going through that process compared to a proper install for a VRF... I mean, that's a night and day process and you can make a whole lot of mistakes in that hydronic piping and get away with it and be perfectly fine you, you'll get away with it that would not would not work doing a traditional vrf install and piping that's one of the major benefits i see moving to a hydronic based system all your refrigerants contained outside and here's the other thing Water as a refrigerant is cheap compared to having to buy. In some of these cases, we're, we're dealing with VRF systems that are hundreds of pounds of charge. I guess not that uncommon um, to where you're sitting there, but somewhere on the low end, 70, 80 pounds. And I've worked on systems that were uh, over 200 pounds of refrigerant. Now, granted, it's pushing the limitations of what modern VRF technology can do, but these things are prone to leaks. Leaks are one of the major factors, and so um, that's a lot of refrigerant to have to replace every time there is a leak that nobody caught for a long time, and you lost a large percentage of your refrigerant charge. Versus all that's just water, you refill your water pipe, and water as a leak tends to show up a lot quicker because, well, it, it doesn't just evaporate as soon as it hits atmosphere. It'll create a wet spot or it'll calcify wherever it's at. You know, it will become evident that there's a problem there. The other side of it is um, you can use traditional hydronic fan coils with a hydronic VRF package. Whereas a traditional VRF, you have to use their proprietary stuff. And that's not the case with these hydronic systems. You can use whatever indoor system you want. At least that's my understanding. Because at that point, the chiller, all the chiller cares about is leaving water. As long as it can produce leaving water the way it wants to, it doesn't care what's happening beyond that. So that's where this VRF chiller really bridges that gap. Um, and I, I'm not trying to sell this. I'm trying to explain what I see. And these are going to be the things that the, the good salesmen who are going to be pushing this and who are going to be convincing the people that sign the checks on this stuff to buy it. This, these are going to be the things they're going to be pushing if they're good and if they actually understand what their equipment is. So just know like these, if these conversation topics aren't already stuff you see floating around, this is what's going to be coming. And these are going to be the pushing points you're going to start to see where this is a more universal system that is far less proprietary. And from a efficiency standpoint and a cost standpoint, it's going to really challenge air cooled sc uh, scrolls. But then when you push it into the screw side, if you can put enough of these together, now, I, I, the, the numbers I'm aware of, at least right now, is you can put 16 outdoor units together for a total of like 240 tons of, of cooling capacity specifically. Well, you could get a pretty decent screw chiller for that. But these come without the noise. See, there's not a, there are quieter screws than others on the market, for sure. But they're all still freaking loud. And ain't none of them actually quiet. 
there's just some that you can have a normal conversation standing beside and a lot of them you can't without yelling at each other so that noise for the noise impact for the screws has been one of the biggest issues for that sector and trying to just I, I've, I've had my own horror stories there and trying to build custom sound boxes for screws and let me tell you like it's no small task it is a pain I've, I've tried to engineer this stuff myself and working with other people as a team and it just it's not a simple process and screw there's just the nature of a screw though like you're not going to get that much quieter than they already are um at least not with technology that, that's currently available i'll say it that way so yeah you can compete on the same efficiency level without the drawbacks of the noise and it's a modular footprint see all of these outdoor heads they just connect to one another off of a parallel header. With a lot of these buildings, uh, I've seen a lot of design, when, when the building was designed with VRF as the cooling system, as the concept, what they'll do lots of times is they'll build these little, um, uh, they're not parapet, but um, these little balcony type setups on the sides of the building that's for all the mechanical. And it may wrap a couple of corners to fit the contour of the building. And they'll just line these VRFs kind of in that contour and just they'll tuck it away to the side without having to dedicate all the roof space and get into all the regulations around roof safety and service. And I get, I don't know all the ins and outs, but it, it changes a lot in a positive way by being able to do that. Well, you'll have you'll have that ability with this kind of pipings because now your system you know, will now be able to bend and flex to follow and kind of mold to the contour of your building or your space while still keeping it all interconnected and it's still the same loop. These are not small things and these are these are big problems that we've had to deal with or address or if a customer wants to go hydronic um but now they've got to to build a platform and they've got to reinforce the decking uh if it's up on the roof or they've got to have a proper slab outside that can support the weight of this equipment and they can manage these things I guess part of my point is if it's this easy for me to sit here from my position and just speak plainly and these this is my observation and I'm not a manipulative salesman trying to push this product. I'm not saying all salesmen are manipulative, but I'm just saying for those that are, um, this isn't going to be that hard to sell, in my opinion. That's one reason why I wanted to give it its own little space here. And I could have just rolled it in with an air-cooled um, uh, air scr uh, scroll, as an example, or the scroll chillers. It's technically where it, where it really does belong. Um, but we see it as something different because, it, well, it's VRF. It's different. And it's really different because we've been marketed into thinking it's different because it looks different and it acts different. And so we think of VRF as its own separate complete entity. And, and in some cases you can make strong arguments that it is. I'm not, I'm not trying to ignore that, but give this five to 10 years and over the next one to two years, the other manufacturers are not going to allow Samsung to take over this market at all, especially Mitsubishi, LG, and Daikin. Those three are the three kings of the market, and they are not going to allow Samsung that much footprint. So Samsung, as far as I can tell, got the win for being the first one to hit the market. With, a, with what seems like a successful system, we'll really we'll find out long term. These others are right behind them. I'm telling you, and they're they're gonna they're gonna sink their teeth into this. So we just we got to be prepared, and it's up to us as the technician to know 
what it is that the customer needs from us, what we need to work on as service, and it's it's up to us. Now that does come back to one of the some of the issues uh, that I think we're going to have the control packages. I still think we're going to have all the same problems there with inverter failures, filter failures, all, like the whole all the modules in there. That's still probably going to be a problem. Um, granted, the the turnaround time is a lot better than it used to be, but it's still going to be a problem. Now, technician training and this this mentality that we have that well, it's a VRF, it's uh, something out of my league. It's just too complicated, or whatever. I don't I don't know what I don't know all the things that get gets in people's heads, but that's going to be an issue for, for us. And it's going to be an issue for the customer because there's a lot of people that won't service VRF. Now they've got to find people who not only are willing to work on VRF, but also willing to work on hydronics because my gut tells me there's probably quite a few people who've gotten comfortable with just regular VRF systems. And now you, th- you complete, you flip the game and turn it into a hydronic system. And now it needs to function like a chiller. And we've got to pay attention to things like approach values. And we've got to now think like a chiller because of that evaporator. That like that changes things. And they're probably not going to want to touch it. So we, we become a bottleneck at that point of being able to service it. However it turns out, I could be totally wrong. Technology could fall flat on its face. We'll see. I'm just observing history and what I've watched happen with industry trends. And where I see the trends moving... And these are heat pump chillers. Heat pump chillers that are non-VRF are becoming a more and more of a push. I see more and more marketing around those types of systems. And going to places like AHR, it's everywhere. A lot of people are pushing heat pump chiller systems that have a two-pipe heating, cooling, hydronic system that eliminates... Maybe not entirely, but some needs for your your backup heating system where you can you can come off of you can still have the hydronics without having to have fossil fuel um, heating systems to to come alongside the hydronic side. That's that's a big push happening, and these fall right into that camp. This is my view of what I see happening. Again, give it five or ten years, probably closer to ten years. And we're going to see a world where it's not going to be uncommon to have to go run a VRF air-cooled chiller call. But I hope you see how it's all a lot of the same stuff. There's not a single component in there that we don't already use somewhere else in the same way. It's just packaged a little differently. And it's got a different control system. So if there's a takeaway here, let that be your takeaway. You can work on this. You do understand this more than you may feel like you do. And you know how all these things work. We've gone in depth on how all these things work. It's just going to be packaged and look a little different. That's it.